three years ago was the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, I think. And there was a wonderful exhibit on the west side of all things that were Star Trek. It was beautifully rendered. And um, it, it, I think the story of Star Trek, if I have my facts right, is they didn't quite know where they were going. It was canceled three times on television. It was canceled as a TV series. But Star Trek, you know, um, Spock and Kirk, you know, is a relationship in the world that is irresistible. You know, I mean, it's just irresistible. I can say the name Spock and Kirk and no one doesn't need interpretation. Right. Um, you know, it's almost like Shylock. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, that's Shylock's pretty old, you know. And it, so it, I do believe that if one has a view that I'm going to sound fancy and pretentious, I don't mean to, that is in great stories or so-called literature, that there's a sort of eternal quality or the possibility for a quality in which people really are attached to the characters because they're more than written in place. Like, they're not just that TV show. They're that in the world. That, <clears throat> that John Le Carre's IP, although it's a story in 19, early 70s, or it's the night manager, comes back and you love it. And <clears throat> that um, if you manage it well, stories, Roald Dahl stories, you know, James and the Giant Peach, uh, you know, is, I wouldn't say eternal, but it's pretty spectacular. It can transcend. It does. So you can say, well, James and the Giant Peach, what did, how did it sell when it came out? 50 years, it sold okay. You know, so I don't know how many times it's been redone. So I only say it as to illustrate. I do think that in The Walking Dead, it's, you know, it's um, Lord of the Flies, meaning it's fairly eternal. It's what happens, how society organizes itself. And of course we care about ratings. But Fear the Walking Dead, which examines the same universe, is among the three highest rated shows on basic cable. We pay a lot of attention to the creative. I'll get back to Scott Gimple. And shows that are about it are very attractive, and games are very attractive, and so we have a plan for movies. And they will have certain characters who, in a way, reemerge, and I think it's going to be electrifying. But, but it's all about somebody's brain. It's all about Scott Gimple's and Andrea Kang's vision, because... Your showrunners. Yeah, because he has to figure out the plot. He's got to be a little bit Shakespeare-ish and figure out how to make it intriguing. Now, if you hang out with him, your confidence goes sky high. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, it just goes sky high because you know, we can all tell when there's a picture and a rap that sounds hollow and a picture and a rap that is thrilling. And his is thrilling. And it goes on for a very long time. So I have an awful lot of confidence that he is going to bring to the world. By the way, it's like he was born to do this. And he'll tell you that. You know what I mean? It's, so it's very exciting. So look, we have a lot to prove, of course, but I do, there's plenty of evidence in the world that... That there's appetite. Yeah, and by the way, I think certain companies have been splendid at it. Disney has been particularly adept, I think, at managing so-called franchises. So you're looking at, at that as a... Yeah, well. we look at it to learn from, because I think that they look at it like this. They don't look at it like this. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, George Lucas, you know, when he, even when he started out, I remember meeting you know, glancingly him, but a guy named Sid Gannis, and who was his marketing person, and you remember Sid? Yeah. And you know, he, they didn't have a view of like, go get to, go sell tickets. They were all about endurance and the long-term quality of Star Wars. And I think that they, you know, you can do it. I mean, there's many examples. You have to have the right fundamental thing.